closer to our panel discussion. So, um, Nikki, any luck? She can hear, but she can't speak. That's, that's okay. <laughs> Just had myself on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah, you were coming out of a speaker downstairs in the basement. That was the problem. Sorry, I'm sorted now. <laughs> <laughs> well, terrific. Well, we we um, may as well get started now. Um, so I'm very pleased to rec uh, to welcome our audience, our distinguished speaker Larry Brody, and our panelists to the Frontier in Precision Medicine webinar. Um, over the past few years, Dr. Brody, along with colleagues from the research community and the National Human Genome Research Institute, assembled a strategic version, uh, vision of priorities and opportunities in human genomics. Um, this um, vision is published now in the journal Nature, and that came out in October, um, and strongly recommend for anybody who has not read it to give it, um, to look through it. It's a, it's a really um, insightful um, valuable uh, 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 position. So, um, so for today, I hope that today's webinar will be engaging and interactive. We've set it up a little different um, with a panel discussion. We're going to hear from Dr. Brody and then have the panel discussion with representatives from the University of Utah community and then questions from you, the audience. And so, um, uh, so um, I want to briefly introduce the panelists and the areas um, that they are representing so that when we have this panel discussion that you kind of have an idea of some questions that you may want to address to a specific panelist or the panel in general. So I have, um, so if the panelists want to just kind of wave their hand when I <laughs> bring them up, I have Dr. Nikki Camp who's a professor of internal medicine and senior research director of the Utah Population Database. And she will represent genomic data science. I have Dr. Clement Chow, assistant professor of human genetics and co-leader of the Functional Genomics Analysis Service. And he will represent genome structure and function. I have Dr. Joshua Bonkowski, Professor of Pediatrics, who has been key to launching universal newborn screening and will represent bringing genomics to the clinic or implementation science. I have Dr. Kim Kaffingst, Professor of Communication that will represent genomics and society. Dr. Amy Hopkins, Instructor of Biochemistry and Director of University of Utah Certificate in Personalized Healthcare that will represent training and genomic workforce development. So have kind of a nice breadth of, of areas. Um, my goal is to make the community aware of the NHGRI strategic vision, understand where Utah has alignment with this vision, and to um, encourage our community to collaborate and develop programs and lead in the area of genomic medicine. So finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Larry Brody. His doctoral work was in human genetics at Johns Hopkins University and went on to be a Howard Hughes postdoctoral fellow at University of Michigan in the early 1990s. It is there that I had the great fortune of getting to know him um, as I was a technician in the lab and um, it was a very close knit lab. We did a lot of really fun things together. In 1993, we all went our separate ways. He joined what would eventually become the National Human Genome Research Institute, and I headed off to graduate school. But we always managed to connect at the ASHG conference. All of those from Michigan, we managed to kind of get together and, and um, share what each other has been up to. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of a, a really wonderful, 30 years of, of tromping through human genetics and, and sharing our lives. So um, a good handful of us here at Utah have had the privilege of working with Dr. Brody. He has a long standing presence in the Breast Cancer Consortium and has worked and published with Sean Tavtigian and others in that area. He currently directs the Division of Genomics and Society at NHGRI. And in this role, he interfaces with Jeff Botkin and Kim Kaffingst. And if any of you visited the special exhibit a few years ago at the National History Museum of Utah, Genome Unlocking Life's Code, Dr. Brody was a key developer in this collaboration with the Smithsonian Institute. And it was really, it was really a really cool exhibit. 
Um, along with all this, Dr. Brody has an active research lab that studies, among other things, genetic variants in genes involved in folate metabolism that are the basis of multiple health conditions, including birth defects and diseases of aging. So today, Dr. Brody will be speaking on the future of human genome research, challenges and opportunities, and welcome, Larry. Thank you, Deb. 30 years, oh my God, it's a very long time. Um, and uh, when Deb knew me, I actually had hair. Um, and I do believe that I've been maybe skiing once with Deb, but in Michigan on a landfill. So there's mm -hmm. a, a, near the University of Michigan, there's a ski hill. It is literally a pile that's an old landfill and it's open as a ski area. So as, as much as I would have liked to be seeing the mountains, I'm not a big skier, um, but I can tell you that uh, what you have out there that is much nicer than the landfill in, <laughs> uh, in Michigan. Uh, it actually I'm also has- I'm going to in um, that people to, um, if you have questions, could you put them in the chat and we'll address them at the end and then also during the discussion. So, um, sorry, I've forgotten that important piece. <laughs> No, no problem. And I want to also thanks for the invitation. Uh, it is uh, it is actually really cool. Michigan uh, was one of the nodes of human genetics, but it wasn't as big and as important when I was in training that, that Utah was. Uh, and uh, your university and the location has really been a pioneer in human genetics. And, and for those of you that don't know, 30 years ago, human genetics was a very, very different uh, discipline. Uh, it was kind of torn a little bit between some basic science and lots of medical genetics uh, and, and not necessarily the, the very robust, hot research field that it is now. Um, so I, I like human genetics, that's why I went into it. It turned out to be a good choice because it's a field that's only grown. And some of the real exciting stuff and, and seminal papers were coming out of um, the human genetics group in, at the University of Utah, some of which are people who are still on this call. So what, what I like to do today, and I really will try to go quickly so that we can have a true discussion uh, for, for, for two reasons. My talk is going to be the corporate talk, basically a, a walk through our strategic vision uh, through a slide deck that we um, use when we come out and represent the, the Genome Institute. Most of this was put together by Eric Green, our, um, our um, Institute Director. Eric gives a lot of talks. You may have seen some of these slides already because they're cribbed from him. But outside of the corporate, as, as someone who works in human genetics, I'd like to spend time talking about things that I think um, are, are worth emphasizing. And I'll do some of that during the talk in addition to the official uh, work that comes out of the Institute. But I also want to say that the strategic vision, when the str we're calling it a vision instead of a plan, in part because sometimes visions is something very further in the distance, uh, in addition to concrete implementation plans. Um, it is not our plan necessarily. It is a product that the Institute put together after consulting, and you'll see um, over a very long time course, a large number of people in the field, including, I know, some of you who are listening now have contributed to this plan. So it really is, um, you should get the credit for this uh, effort should go to the community and us as just a vessel for kind of condensing it. And I don't know if Jeff Botkin's on or not, but um, Jeff knows that it, we also had to condense it at the behest of nature. Um, the thing that we had submitted was nearly twice as long. Uh, and they asked us to cut it by half, um, um, echoing uh, if any of you have seen or read the river runs through it where the the father is teaching the uh, the student how to write and the student comes up with an essay and he says, this is good, now cut it in half. And they do that three times till they get to the essence. I, I think we actually lost some of the, the content by some of the cutting, but it's still boiled down to its essence. Uh, so with, um, I'll just now get in, I'll share screen and we'll just get into some of the highlights. I would emphasize that if you really want to know in detail to read the, the plan, because they because it got cut down by half, it's only it's only three or four pages with some um, boxes and other diagrams, and we have made it um, readily available, so you can download it from our website uh, as well as from the Nature website. 
it's freely, I think we paid for an extra license to get it freely available. So let me go back to the slides and share the talk. Um, and I'm hoping that you're seeing the slides now. Someone just give me a nod that I'm seeing the slides. Okay, good. Um, you, you'll see um, this talk includes some of our themes. The forefront of genomics is something we like to call the mantra for the Institute. Uh, yeah, I'll explain why we think uh, we should be at the forefront. Um, and it's not really just an arrogant thing. It's also, um, it gives us a, a certain mission. Uh, I want to just go back as to why the heck are we publishing a strategic plan in a, in nature? Part of that, part of the reason of that is history um, in that it goes back to the human genome project, which um, for those of you that were involved in it was a project where we really didn't know how to complete it when we started it. And every five years or so, there would be a reassessment of where the technology is about at what is feasible and what should be achieved in the next five years. So as a single monolithic project, let's sequence the human genome, it made sense to be very, very open and public about the goals of the project. And I, I stop here, you'll see this very last one, our new goals um, from 1998 to 2003. And 2003 marked the, the end and the completion of the project. Because these, um, efforts of putting out strategic plans in a very public way seemed to catch the interest of the scientific community, got engagement of the scientific community. The Institute continued to do that. And we have published in 2003 and, and 2011 um, more strategic plans. They weren't every five years. They, they, you'll see this one got updated after seven years, this one after nine years. And basically they're updated now when they kind of get a little rickety and the field has changed and we have new things to, to talk about. Uh, it was a surprise to me that um, all NIH institutes are required to produce a strategic plan. If you're interested in the strategic plan of any institute, you should be able to find it online and it's a, essentially a, a reporting requirement. I don't know that any other institute creates strategic plans and visions the, the way we do. Most of them are done by a retreat and they, everyone gets in and they write stuff. And, and most of them are quite, quite long, much longer than ours. Um, it's worthwhile if you have a specific uh, interest that's the purview of a specific institute to look at their strategic plans as well. Um, one of the, the things that pushed the, um, new strategic plan is that genomics and genetics, human genetics has changed uh, since the issuing of the last strategic plan. Uh, and, and shown here is just we, uh, a nice artistic representation of how it's changed. And so we start from the Human Genome Project, which is really just about taking this molecule and converting it to um, letters and letters in the computer, and then subsequently annotating those letters but the real impact of the Human Genome Project, the real impact of human genomics comes as you branch out into model organisms and into the clinic and into the lab, and, uh, eventually into uh, applications. Uh, and you'll see here, this is meant to represent that. You not only have the basic scientists, but the clinicians and all um, the different end users of human gen genomic information. And, and we expect this tapestry to be continued to be woven uh, for a while, uh, because we don't think we've reached full potential of using genomic information. Um, the pion, as, as Deb mentioned, was published. We did not get the cover of nature at that time. African diversity, and you'll see diversity is a, a big theme that has been woven through our work as well. Uh, but the plan was published in this issue of nature. And as I said, you can get the full preprint directly from our website. Um, we were struck with how to divide this plan up. And so we did it not, uh, if you're sequencing the human genome, you can say, we're gonna build clones, we're gonna put them together, we're gonna sequence, we're gonna do this. Uh, the future doesn't lend itself to that simple uh, linear progression. So we, we organized the plan among uh, several different categories and they're just shown here, uh, guiding principles and values foundation for genomics, breaking down barriers and compelling projects. 
one of the things that we're reasonably proud of and associated with the Institute is that we do a lot of barrier breaking um, and um, either through technology or for supporting research that uh, essentially changes the field. Uh, but it needs to be put on a, a robust foundation. And um, nicely, one of the things we heard in a lot of the meetings we had is that we really should um, codify and completely embrace certain guiding principles and values. So what I'm gonna do for the next probably 10, 15 minutes is do some highlights of the plan uh, and obviously not go through it in, in extreme detail. I picked a few that I think are relevant um, to uh, a great academic medical center like University of Utah. So first, the process. This really is a very long process. We started planning the production of our strategic plan in 2017. Uh, we didn't tell anyone about it until we officially launched it in 2018. And there were a lot of events in here. Uh, I honestly don't remember if we came to Utah a bunch, there, instead of having uh, one meeting, where everyone came, we went out to various um, places and meetings, and some of you may have participated in these. First, they were um, listening sessions, just to hear what people think should be in a strategic van. And then halfway through, we switched to, here's what we've heard, what do you think? And some of you may have participated in those groups. Uh, that led to a draft paper, a, a submission, and then eventually publication. Nicely timed to be, um, at the 30th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project. Our institute is very good at finding anniversaries. We celebrate the anniversary of the completion of the project, the completion of the draft project, the launch of the project. Um, there, there's a lot of anniversaries to be had to, to peg things to, but it was very nice to be tied to that. Um, so the strategic vision is out. The next is how to go from planning to implementation. And then, and, and I'll just be, crass about this. Implementation means where are we going to spend money? And that obviously gets people quite interested. What areas do we think need to be done? Um, and so the strategic, what the strategic planning process does, it gets us a, a view of ideas and needs and proposals and, and obstacles to be removed. They're all funneled in. They get into the vision. And the next phase is implementation of the vision. Uh, when I say implementation, you'll see in a few minutes, uh, implementation uh, of the vision is not just what NHGRI will do. Um, and I can tell you that we, in the early stages, we always struggle as to whether what we're doing is producing a strategic plan or a strategic vision for NHGRI or a strategic plan or vision and encouragement for the entire field. Uh, we started out thinking we would do the former and in the end we do the latter uh, and mainly is because genomics and genetics has been embraced by so many groups that are not traditionally funded by NHGRI. Uh, the end point of this are essentially projects, programs and, and initiatives. Initiatives in the NIH speak is a, a term for we're going to put out a request for applications. Um, but we also hope to do policies and data sharing is another policy that the, the um, NIH is, uh, is quite, uh, have actively embraced the, the ethos that has started with the sharing of data from the Genome Project. Uh, we start with the guiding principles and values. Uh, I think this is an area that um, is un maybe unusual to have in a strategic plan, but it really fit very nicely with uh, our uh, structure. And, i summarizing essentially a, a relatively large amount of text by saying uh, diversity is clearly a, a goal. Um, and this is diversity, not just in the, the workforce, but um, also in, uh, I mean, not, not just in the people who participate in genomics research. We know we have a, a, a very big weak spot in the data set and study participant, but also in the workforce and who's doing the science. Uh, we also codified that um, uh, the plan and our institute should stand for equity and social justice. It's interesting we did this a couple of years ago, if you look at the timeline, uh, and the call for this has only been stronger across the entire um, academic world as well as the, the U.S. in general. Uh, one thing that 
for those of you that remember, there was criticism of the Human Genome Project because it was not um, standard biology. It was it was this giant project, and there won't be no one will get credit for it. Uh, well, one of the things that the um, human genome big science um, showed us is that um, modern biology can be really tackled quite well by consortia and team science. Uh, and as someone who really loves working in teams, like this, this is one of my personal things that I think is really, really important. Uh, the biological questions, human genetics questions, don't lend themselves to fitting into the standard chemistry department, physics department, biology department kind of structure. Or if you're on the academic medical side, they don't fit into radiology, pediatrics. They really bridge all of these things. And so we really support team science. Uh, as I mentioned, open science and data sharing is really a pillar of what the Genome Project um, uh, brought to this, the field of biology, uh, going back to the Bermuda principles in 1995, where it was declared that the, the sequence we generate will get put into the public domain immediately. Uh, and now we push an open science and data sharing as essentially a fundamental principle, at the same time honoring um, human subjects issues and, and other ethical constraints. The more open generally, the better. Um, and for those of you that were in human genetics early, early in the early days, there was often uh, very, very secretive, competitive things that were somewhat, uh, in my mind, somewhat destructive to the field uh, because it delayed getting on with the research. Uh, one of the other things that is not, um, is not sexy, not, not really something to get excited about, but so incredibly important are data standards. And that's another fundamental principle to make sure that there's standardization as you're generating data, maybe standardization of genetics and medical records, standardization of uh, software to use to analyze genetics. And an institute like NHGRI and the field, um, the Sanger as well, can kind of create de facto standards that everyone would use. It just makes the science go so much faster. Um, the other element in, in addition to the principles is to essentially our goal is still to improve the foundation of genomics. Um, anyone in this room can go on and see um, an annotated human genome with a, a few clicks. Anyone in the world can do it. Uh, and uh, the fruits of the human genome project are available readily and easily and uh, are constantly getting more embellished and better. Um, so one way to sustain that is to make sure that we put a lot of effort into genomic data science. Um, that will lead to the essentially, eventually standardization by best practices uh, through experimentation, but we also fund management of resources and, and fund analyses. One of the things in my own research that is really, really incredibly fun is to be able to answer questions by using data that's readily available instead of actually pulling up a pipette and doing an experiment. Uh, and that's really one of the ways of the future. Doesn't mean you're going to do away with doing experiments, doesn't mean you can shut down every single lab, but there's so much you can augment your own questions with, with data sets that in, in many cases are so much larger and will cost so much more than you could have done as an individual investigator. Um, we still think comparative genomics is the way, and I'll mention a specific project that is very important, so we're not abandoning uh, model organisms and basic science, to, um, we are trying to make them more efficient. For those of you that are in the model organism world know there's a little bit of strain in our trying to make the model organism databases more efficient and let the researchers focus on the organism and make the data more central and easier for everyone else to use. Um, along with the data sharing is really to empower folks who participate in our study as partners to understand eventually, um, potentially uh, get all of their information back. And that's one of the guiding principles of the All of Us project. Uh, but that's a, that's a shift from the way we used to do genetics where thank you for your blood sample, we won't see you any, again. Uh, along with this is we have uh, made a commitment to doing genomic literacy. One of the things that I also oversee is our educational and community outreach branch. And it, their work emphasizes how important it is for um, the, the 
leaders in, in, the, in Congress, as well as the general public and study participants to really have a good feel for what genomics results means. Uh, in some ways, this means we have to undo a little bit of what we've done in the past. Um, for the past 50, 60 years, everyone in this room was taught Mendelian genetics. And the general public thinks Mendelian genetics is everything to do with genetics. And I've been um, politely creating this throw Mendel under the bus campaign to try to undo some of that. I, I don't say, I know this is semi-public, I haven't said that in public yet, but one of the things we have to do is, is change the way uh, the general public looks at genetics because most genetics that we do now is not the deterministic Mendelian genetics. And along the way is also, if we are going to have precision medicine, we need to figure out how to have healthcare providers have a um, literacy sufficiency and comfort in all surveys of general practitioners say they're not comfortable with it. And it's still not yet incorporated in medicine in any really super functional way. It's one of the reasons why I was really enthusiastic about when I, came, I did stumble across your certificate program that we talk about later. Breaking down barriers, we've identified a few things where our um, institute, which does have a very strong record in stimulating um, research into new technologies could, could actually make an impact. And those are, um, in this case, DNA synthesis technologies, which are, are a ton better than they used to be. They, they still need to get better. And obviously genome editing uh, has leaped uh, orders of magnitude uh, in the last five years. Um, the gene editing tools you hear a lot about it from the gene therapy thing, if you're into the, the lay press, but really a lot of the power of gene editing is essentially as a molecular biology tool to test lots of different things and use that. So we're still working in that area. We think it's critically important to get better at characterizing genomic variants. If I were to sequence anyone in this room, I'd come up with a lot of new variants that have never been seen before and quite a few of them, I would have no idea what they mean. So we have a significant investment, um, uh, Hallmark a, a lot by the ClinGen program, uh, to figure out better ways to characterize genomic variants. Um, understanding mosaicism, this is, I put this in the category as something that is either the tip of an iceberg or just an ice cube floating around. Um, I think at this point, we, we, know, we know and we know for years that every time your DNA replicates, you create a certain little mosaic clone in that cell and any cells that go on to it. It's still unclear as to how much it contributes to health and disease. Um, and I think it needs some effort to figure out whether it's just an interesting phenomenon or it underlies lots of disease. And so this is essentially a lot of this is somatic mosaicism, non-cancer. There's another institute for that. They're <laughs> very much larger for, than us. They've got their mission, I think, pretty well in hand uh, and have essentially embraced a lot of what, uh, a lot of the fruits of the Human Genome Project into oncology, which is very important. Um, but I'm specifically talking about uh, non-cancer related somatic mosaicism. One of the other things that we need to get better at is um, implementation science. It's, it's not something that uh, the people who sequence the genome necessarily bring the skill set to do. We have to recruit people who are good at implementing, doing implementation science in, in order to bring these into clinical care. Um, one of the other sections of the, the paper was um, compelling genomics research projects in biomedicine. I, I can tell you if it's something you're interested in, it is compelling. If you're not interested in it, people said, eh, this is not that compelling. Um, so there's a list of those um, in, um, in, in the strategic vision. I'll just highlight a few. Uh, despite the fact that we are getting better at understanding regulatory elements and we are orders of magnitude, uh, better at understanding them from when we were just dissecting the hemoglobin promoter. You know, some of you may know, I mean, it took almost a decade just to figure out the, the one kilobase upstream of the hemoglobin gene. And, and even then you missed things that were hundred kilobases away. Uh, we really do need to get better at understanding genes and regulatory elements uh, and decorating them and annotating them with their methylation status and epigenetic changes is a, a good step but it, it doesn't necessarily um, tell you how everything interacts. Uh, the same is true of the non-Mendelian uh, contributors. 
to diseases and traits. Uh, we can enumerate now, I, someone can correct me, I know we're over three, 400 genes that contribute to height. Uh, we're probably over a thousand genes that contribute to type two diabetes. Uh, we can do polygenic risk scores from them, but the architecture of those uh, and how they interact and how they interact with the environment is still uh, an open question. Um, I'll bring up diversity again, diversity in genomics research, both from the practitioners and the participants. Uh, one of the things that uh, I will be frank, we were slow to embrace is something other than DNA uh, and something other than DNA and RNA. Uh, I think I've always thought that looking at other things in an omic type way, meaning proteomics, metabolomics, um, kinomics and all the other omics that are out there, uh, it probably needs more attention now and could some of these fields could use standardization. Uh, they ultimately can lead you back to the genome. So I, I think it's pretty easy for us to justify supporting those. Um, and we talked about, and I'll show you a, a virtuous cycle kind of diagram about using genomic learning in healthcare systems. I'll show it to you now. Um, this is the how we see this interacting between the, this double virtuous engine between basic genomics research and a genomic learning and healthcare system. This looks really um, makes a lot of sense. If you only have to have this thing cycle in the slide, it works perfectly, but it doesn't work perfectly now when you start having these steps hit the real clinic in the real world or having the basic science uh, work not be able to get over to this bridge. So if you, uh, and this figure is, I'm pretty sure this figure is in the, made it into the final, did, okay. Some of them got cut, I um, made it. So if you look at this, you can think about opportunities on fix, injecting knowledge, not fixing, injecting knowledge into the places that don't turn very well together. Um, we also had a section and we knew that this would get a lot of coverage called bold predictions. Again, if it's something that you get excited about, you say, oh, that's kind of bold. If it's something that you think is really boring, you say, ah, it's not that bold. So there's, there's uh, just, uh, I think, 10 uh, bold predictions or so it, it, in a box in the paper, they're, they're worth looking at. Whenever you're doing this, you do pick some that are probably sustainable and attainable and some that are a reach. Uh, just highlight uh, um, a few, I don't expect you to, to read this. Some are really sound bites more for getting people thinking such as having your genome and your ability to interpret your genome on your cell phone. Right now, it is easy to put your, your sequence of uh, three or six billion letters on your cell phone, but interpreting it is a different story. Um, and that um, there, there are a bunch of those there that are worth looking at. Um, several of them, and this is just to highlight um, the translational uh, aspects of them. And I'm guessing you know, it's hard to know how these are projecting when you're doing a Zoom talk compared to a screen. So um, I would just refer you to the, the uh, paper to look at them. Okay. just want to talk about oops, a couple of the guiding principles that I think are really important. We have talked about the genomics workforce. And I'm bringing these up because, bringing this up specifically, because in a few minutes, I'll just show you, we have already started on this, down this path already. Um, and so that's one of the guiding principles. I've already mentioned this one. This is one of my favorites in part because I really like working in transdisciplinary teams. Uh, I really like working with people who know more than me about the field that they're working in. Um, and to a certain extent, I like teaching them in my field as well. I just highlighted those two. Um, the um, robust foundations, these are the elements that we talked about. And um, again, this is the workforce, it's, um, essentially foundational item, and we have moved on to start implementing that. And we now have, and you can find on our website, uh, after after a year-long effort, um, mostly led by Ben Sponham in our institute, uh, uh, an agenda, an action agenda to plan to essentially build a more diverse genomics workforce. Um, and this was published in the American Journal of Genetics just recently. 
and you can see the goals here. Some of those are bully pulpit goals where we said, we hope you would do this. Some of them are, this is the right thing to do. We're gonna help do them from our office of the director kind of effort. And some of them obviously would be things where we'll say, we would like you to do this and we will give you money if your proposals are good, which is obviously of interest to the academic community. Um, these are some of the things that you will see and some are already out um, in, uh, in fulfilling some of the goals in the strategic plan. So when I say already out, some of them are already being acted upon. Some of them are incorporated into projects that are going on and others are coming out as program announcements and RFAs. Uh, we do have other one. I, I can't, we, we have to not talk about things um, that for future funding opportunities until they can be shared with everyone at the same time. I, as you might guess, there are other things in the strategic plan that are likely to have funding announcements coming out. Um, and then I can just suggest you watch for them. Um, you, one other element, if you're interested, is that we decided to have a seminar series. We're now, I believe, up to the third one. So you've only missed the first two. They've been recorded. But where we've asked, a, in most cases, an established senior states person investigator and a more early stage investigator to tackle the problems of the bold predictions. Um, and so these are available for viewing um, once they're recorded and they're available for viewing live and interacting and asking questions. Um, and there's the, the website if you want to join them. I don't, let's see, they're all at three to 4.30 PM. I hope that doesn't interfere with some standing meeting you might have, but uh, hundreds of people have been um, joining in on these uh, webinars and, and truly getting their questions answered during the live webinars. I think that's where I'd like to, to wrap up. We took several years to create this strategic vision. It'll take several years to roll out the strategic vision and implementation. And so I'll just close with that and say, to just show you that we now have this next chapter. Uh, I'm guessing I may or may not still be around by the time we're ready to do it again, but some of you in the audience might end up being uh, contributing to the next one. And so I'll, I'll end with that and so we can move to the panel. Thank you, Larry. That was that was really great. What I'd love to do now, um, so for people that have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll start to tackle some questions um, as a panel. Um, but first off, um, I am going to have each of the panelists just spend a minute or two um, highlighting what they think Utah's strengths are with this vision. And so I'm going to start with Nikki. Cam? Yeah. Um, so I would first uh, encourage anybody to give this a read. I really enjoyed reading reading the article. Um, and Deb tasked me with genomic data science, which is a bit intimidating because there are lots of people doing lots of different things. But in the spirit of just giving you some flavors that are aligned both with the vision we just heard about and some names. So if any of you have projects that you can connect with people, but it's not exhaustive. And I apologize if I've forgotten anybody who's on here and the work that they're doing. So I'm going to start by just restating probably what we all know that um, computational approaches to characterize the genome is a real strength here. And in fact, we have a group um, now set up uh, Utah Center for Genomic Discovery um, that includes Gabba Marth, Aaron Quinlan and Mark Yandel. And those guys are doing a lot of work in identifying, calling, bioinformatically annotating, complex variants. So anybody who's doing, who, who, who that could support their research, you should definitely um, um, get in, in touch with those guys. They also are doing rollouts of how do you do this at scale, which of course is hugely important because we're all doing these massive collaborations and also at speed, which I will leave to Josh, who will talk about operate, operationalizing in clinics, which is important. The other thing I wanted to point out is kind of the other side of the equation. So we really want to, to understand diseases and do genomic medicine. 
But part of that is the description of the phenotype itself. And there's a lot of groups here thinking about how we can better characterize phenotypes from lots of different ways. I'm gonna mention kind of three different kind of things that are going on. So number one, we can't say, we can't have, I can't not talk about the Utah Population Database. So we have a, a, a brilliant database here, um, 10 million people in it across the state and from the, from the pioneers on to the modern day, 5 million of which are with it, have at least three and up to 18 generations of genealogy. The cancer registry since the, the late 60s, and then probably 15 to 20 years of hospital records for the Intermountain Healthcare Systems and the university, which together cover 85% of, of Utah. So I'm actually a little bit and beyond as well. So our capacity to do things, um, mining those data and especially um, mining familial clustering, of course, we've used that in the past just to get high risk for a single pedigree. Um, but we're now thinking about how you can do multi-phenotype clustering, including the environment. Um, and I will just shout out Heidi, which Heidi Hansen, who's on the call. So if you have any phenotypes you're interested in thinking about in that kind of multi-phenotype way to try and narrow down on um, that. Um, I also wanted to mention kind of the um, efforts going forward in kind of the artificial intelligence realm. Um, so Mark Yandel, again, human genetics has been working a lot on how to mine the electronic health records to look for associated phenotypes. Um, and then something I only just recently heard about, which is like, I thought was totally interesting is the idea of using AI to mine video footage um, for kind of like looking for intermediate phenotypes in the neuroscience psychiatry realm. So the idea of getting to phenotypes that might be closer to biology, um, without having to rely on um, questionnaire bases, which is what often happens in, in those types of fields. Um, and then last, um, but not least, because it's actually one of my favorite things on this list, but the idea of using genomics beyond DNA um, to try and come up with intermediate phenotypes. Um, so we've done a lot of work using statistical genomics approaches to, to, to kind of characterize global variability into kind of systems of quantitative traits which can be used in multiple omics and also designed so they can be used alongside more standard things like clinical variables, environmental variables, and, then, and therefore fit into um, kind of frameworks we're used to for doing clinical trials, um, clinical endpoints, epi studies, epi studies, and also hopefully when things are cheap enough, huge cohort studies. So I will, I will finish there and let the other people. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That's, yeah, clearly we have a lot going on um, in that area. Clement, can you, do you want to jump in and um, comment quickly on functional um, uh, activities? Sure. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think everyone knows that Utah is really good at modeling human disease individually in our, in our labs. But um, more recently, I think CGM has kind of really put up the resources to help kind of make this an, a real institutional priority as, as part of this kind of functional analysis core that, that I co-lead with Charlie Murtaugh and um, Joe Yost. And, um, you know, this, this core is really kind of, um, pr its purpose is to, to help bring um, functional analysis to, to clinicians and also to groups that can't immediately bring Bring that kind of analysis to to the work that they are they are producing and the results that they're producing and and I think that this has been working out quite quite well and it's really kind of serving a really nice community purpose. We've been um, we've been building individual patient models that come out of the Penelope program as well as NeoSeq program as well, and I think we'll be starting to do a couple of the other genome sequencing projects that are going on um, in the area as well. But we're also you know testing. A large number of genes from some of the whole exome whole genome studies that are going on for um for for some projects on on campus and I think that this this kind of CGM putting putting kind of the the support behind this kind of this kind of core and this kind of service really kind of helps bring the cl clinical work to a whole nother level on on this campus and I think that this is really the the next um the next frontier for human genomics and human genetics is really what do we do about all these variants that we find. And, and there needs to be, 
I mean, we're trying to do this locally um, to kind of shuttle these variants quickly into, into the lab and try to build initial models and try to get people to study them. But I think that that kind of moving forward nationally, this really needs to be a priority in terms of how do we do this on a larger scale beyond kind of Utah, beyond whatever, whatever um, resources we can put together locally. I think that, that would be really neat to see how, how we can implement that kind of on, on, a, on a nationwide NHGRI wide level. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, that's that's a really neat place to move into and a great opportunity to grow that. Um, I'm going to jump over to Josh Bonkowski now. Um, take a moment to talk about implementation, bring it to the clinic. Thanks. So I'm uh, Josh Bonkowski, if I haven't met anyone here on the call. So uh, so I'm a pediatric neurologist and um, kind of uh, live in the world of clinical stuff, but also um, involved in both bench and clinical translational projects. And um, I think the things that I wanted to briefly talk about were um, trying to use genetic or genomic testing in the early phases of a person's life. So uh, in particularly like newborn screening or testing of infants who are uh, ill. And then the other aspect that I wanted to briefly talk about was trying to um, cross the genomics to clinic divide, because I think that's a major issue as we've all uh, kind of think about. And I've made notes for myself uh, just so I don't uh, go too long or go too short. So um, here, I mean, I think, you know, hopefully we're preaching to the choir a little bit, but uh, we have a lot of strengths for this these kind of efforts. So I think uh, between the University of Utah, in around healthcare, uh, primary children's hospital, we have a really pretty well functioning set of systems that talk to each other and can work together in projects when um, when we get the, the the interest to do so. So I think for like long term big population studies, um, these healthcare systems can really work well together. Um, there's really good database resources, both clinically as well as research wise. I think that's a major strength for how we design projects. And then um, especially, uh, you, know, uh, you know, tooting our own horn, I think in pediatrics, because there's not many pediatric subspecialists other than the ones in the one group here at the university, we have essentially, you know, 100% ascertainment and follow-up. So it's a kind of tremendous resource that I think we're just beginning to tap. Um, with newborn screening and testing at the beginning of life, which is obviously a, a major opportunity for genomic and genetic testing, uh, the challenge that's happened over the past, I'd say, five years is that um, more and more diseases are treatable for young infants and they need to be diagnosed in young infants to make a difference. But the current biochemical testing platforms that exist um, are kind of hitting the limits of how many diseases they can test for. And so obviously genetic or genomic testing seems to be the solution uh, or can be a solution for that kind of issue. However, you know, to implement this at a population level uh, is a challenge because of cost. So for example, the current newborn screening panel test costs less than $100 per infant. And obviously we'd have, if we want to do that on a national level, then, you know, can you bring whole genome sequencing down to a cost uh, and interpretation down to that level of cost. Um, the other issue is another, you know, there's many problems with newborn testing, with privacy, with long-term follow-up, but it has tremendous opportunities. The testing you do at a newborn, you could use again when they're 25 and have diabetes or when they're 45 and have heart disease. And so the single test as a newborn can have long-term um, opportunities. Another strategy that's being used and that's uh, an opportunity. I'm gonna stop you there and we're gonna jump over to Kim just cause I'm hoping to have some time at the back end of this to, to for some Q and A and we, we're down to about the last 10 minutes. So let's jump over to Kim, um, Genomics and Society. Um, <laughs> so I will try to briefly summarize some of the uh, really <laughs> amazing resources that we have here. So just to highlight a couple areas where I think um, we align well with the strategic vision, um, genomic literacy, which you heard about from uh, Dr. Brody. Uh, so I would highlight the UCR, um, the Utah Center for Excellence in LC Research, which is doing some really innovative work on um, genomics education as well as our Genetic Science Learning Center, um, which has done a lot of work both with K through 12, 
um, but also as part of the all of us community engagement efforts. So thinking about genomic literacy, diversity, um, and inclusion. Um, and I won't have time to name them all just in the interest of time, but many of us on the research side are interested in genetic risk communication, um, genetic literacy or genomic literacy, and how you use uh, genomic data in decision making. Um, so just to shout out to um, Lisa Aspinwall and Sarah Knight who are on the call, um, but there are many of us here interested in that. Um, and to highlight some of the really exciting interdisciplinary work um, in this space. So for example, collaborations between um, Huntsman Cancer Institute and the Department of Biomedical Informatics uh, to use data on inherited susceptibility in clinical decisions and clinical decision-making, um, which also relates to the implementation science space. Great, that's a perfect segue over to Amy, <laughs> um, who's going to talk about the, the trainees, uh, training of the genomic workforce. Hello, thank you. Yes, uh, so we do believe that patients need, pardon me, we believe that physicians need a new, new skill set. We've brought together some existing classes and created some new ones to address these needs into a graduate certificate in personalized medicine. We began enrolling medical students in the certificate in fall 2017. So we'll be graduating our first students this spring. Uh, due to time, I'm not going to list our learning outcomes or talk about specific classes, but I would like to thank the multiple people on this call who participate as guest lecturers and research mentors such as Josh and Kim. You make a big impact with our students. But I would like to suggest that we're still in a great deal of flux as the structure of our medical school curriculum itself is changing. Uh, many of you are familiar with the knowledge that step one board exams have just moved from a scored exam this last year to a pass fail exam next year. And that coupled with the fact that we've just successfully been reaccredited and to answer the social justice demands of our moment, um, our institution is embarking on a process to reinvent our entire core curriculum and the timing of how it's taught. It's been termed metamorphosis. I hope anybody who's on this call has received an invitation to some of the 30 plus hours of stakeholder meetings that we've already had. But for those of you who'd like to learn more and to advocate for the educational needs that we care about and to create that genomically informed workforce. I'm going to put a link into the chat. Please, please feel free to participate as much as you'd like. It's terrific. So I'm going to open this up to some questions. Um, I have a handful of questions, but I think I'll um, see if the audience wants to jump in. I'm going to shoot this, my first question off to Dr. Brody. Um, so one thing I, I didn't hear is, was pharmacogenomics. Um, and, and that felt like that was missing. And, and maybe that's not where NHGRI sees the future and kind of where that's going. So it's a little bit of a sore subject in, in some ways because we think pharmacogenetics and one of the slides I didn't show you was the investment in genomics in the NIH portfolio. There's a figure in the paper. Uh, the percent of NIH funds that are invested in genomic science, genomic translation, precision medicine that come from NHGRI compared to the rest of the NIH, we think that we're now only 10% of those that funding. We think that pharmacogenomics is very important, but should be picked up a little bit more across different institutes. So we're working through that. Uh, there are, I mean, obviously there's a few pharmacogenetics things that are absolutely critical um, if you're going to prescribe certain drugs. Uh, what's less clear is how important they are more generically. And I think the, um, the, the Warfarin experience was a, somewhat eye-opening, I think, for a lot of us when it came to everything looks perfect in, in uh, observational trials, everything looks perfect from the theoretical basis, from the biochemical basis, and then you put it out in the real world and it, it performed less well than you would have thought. And so I think some of those trials just need to be done with other ones. I, is the, I don't know if the word's gone. The word was in, some, in the earlier version of the thing. I'd actually have to do a search to see if pharmacogenomics is, is um, been banished. We still do support a amount of pharmacogenomics uh, in, in some ways 
it, it's a little bit more, um, and I wouldn't say established because I don't think we know how much of it to use yet, but at least how to figure out how to use it is, is relatively straightforward. It just requires the investment. I, the, one of the reasons why I bring that up is, is the communication with the public because a lot of people are getting this direct to consumer that, you know, says, oh, well, I can, you know, this drug and that drug, you know, as they do this panel of SNPs and it's something that they can just kind of throw out to people and, and on the education front, I mean, that's kind of that opposite end of the Mendelian of, you know, how do you use that? So, you know, Kim, do you have any thoughts on that, on the communication of, of that knowledge as it's um, bouncing around in direct to consumer? Yeah, just to mention a couple of things. So it's an active area of interest for some of the UCR investigators, sort of how that is being conveyed in the media, for instance, and, um, and how that might be impacting how people think about it. And it's also, of course, an area of interest to our many genetic counselors here uh, at the University of Utah, uh, how you talk with people and maybe improve on how um, public understanding of some of those types of issues. Um, I have can I a couple. A, am I allowed to ask a question? If we, if yes, we don't have please. Can I, can I ask a question of Amy? Because uh, as I mentioned, I when I was preparing for this, I did come across this program, which I was excited about. Um, I didn't realize it was mainly the medical school. Has there been talks with the College of Nursing about um, having some of these things and these certificates be available to other than uh, medical students and people in the in the medical school? Thank you. That's the generous use of your attention. Uh, no, we have not yet reached out to the nursing school. Um, we're pretty excited that we do have interprofessional opportunities just for our students to interact with genetic counseling students. That's, I think uh, our curriculum might have a few gaps that need addressing in the interprofessional space. So even that alone is something that we're, we're a bit proud of. We also get to have um, a little bit of an interdisciplinary opportunity for law students in our um, genetics and medicine, ethical, legal, and social issues class taught by our illustrious George Contreras. But I'm afraid that we haven't expanded out yet in a way to include nursing students. As you can anticipate, our greatest challenge is logistical. Um, but hope, I am hoping that with the revisions to our whole curriculum, um, that'll reduce some of those barriers rather than heighten them. So how many medical students graduated this year with this certificate? It will be 10. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. A, quite a bit of competition between us and a variety of other elective certificates, <laughs> and you know they're a curious bunch. Jo Josh, where where do you see you know some of that genetic um, communication and literacy in the clinic? How, where do you see it coming in? You know, in, in through the nursing field or the existing physicians or the new new uh, students coming on board. Yeah, I think the um, excitement is huge to use this um, kind of tidal wave of information. I think this um, concerning part is that our, um, if you think about us as like a basketball team, our bench is not very deep. And so um, we're really hoping that uh, Amy and other similar folks can supply, you know, to uh, supply our bench to be deeper. Because I think, you know, many of the people who are involved in this work are on this you know, Zoom call right now, um, and then you know, as soon as you kind of leave this you know group, then it, it gets narrow for who's going to actually like uh, do the testing for the patient and tell the patient what what it means. Uh, so it's a little um, you know, how do we kind of build up that um, infrastructure? I think is going to be a important kind of clinical side challenge. Can I pry a little bit into the the Intermountain? Yeah. I know that Intermountain and Utah are kind of interconnected and Regeneron is doing a, a fair bit of sequencing with Intermountain. Are university faculty allowed to avail themselves and do research on the data that is being generated by Regeneron? Well, you've certainly uh, found a sensitive spot to poke. Okay. So, uh, no, but, uh, <laughs> but I think uh, what's happened is that uh, Intermountain set up a, this really large uh, program uh, called Heretogene, um, which is like an adult population-based study, uh, very much kind of like population health, at least from the Intermountain perspective. And then I think for DECODE, 
and Amgen and stuff that they um, were really interested in like new drug discovery. But then I think what's happened is that um, Intermountain, because they work with us really closely, especially like in pediatrics, realize there's also kind of a tremendous like academic opportunity. So there's been a new branch open called the Heritage Children's Study. And so for that, we have kind of bridged the gap between the Intermountain world and the University of Utah to be able to use that data kind of from an academic perspective. Yeah, not, I don't know if there's any deans on the listening in, but if, if and I, if you look at in places where they leveraged off of internal resources, um, it, it tends to be a multiplier effect for essentially securing NIH funds. Um, you know, I'm thinking through the, the Vanderbilt program, Geisinger programs, where the the this, the relatively I wouldn't say modest investment in, in infrastructure, and you already have it with your uh, family core directory, and the, the, essentially the studies you already have, um, really work nicely to, to leverage off to, to get research funding to take advantage of these resources. Um, Amy raised her hand. Deborah, if you didn't see that. Just oh. a wave goodbye. Thank you for your time. Oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, uh, Dr. Brody, just to follow up on your point, I think the challenge that we are facing, or a challenge, and I'm not sure there's really a solution, is that, um, that a lot of these um, private, you know, like pharma or something come in with lots of, they have a deep pockets, but they also carry a lot of strings to the projects that they yeah. want. Yeah, so there's kind of a very challenging uh, um, path to try and walk there. Yeah, no, I know com completely. They, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. And they just, uh, I, I don't know how other places have negotiated some of these. Uh, it, it also tends to siphon off faculty sometimes as well. The one thing I, I would just add to that, Josh, is I think there are, there are strings now, but there's a time frame. So it may be once we're out of that time frame, then there's going to be a, a really nice opportunity there to, to be able to do a little bit more free um, exchange between and, and maybe catalyze some new projects that way. And they're, 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 they're working to link to the UPDB too. So it, it's, I, I think within Utah, whatever goes on at the U and Intermountain, it's going to be a huge opportunity. Yeah, I think to follow up the kind of pharmacogenomics point, like I think, you know, there's um, like a lot of this medicine we do is just kind of like choosing a medicine and we know it works for that category and hoping for the best, but we can use data we already have and look backwards now with genomics information to try and understand patterns of patients that responded better to one versus the other. So I think we kind of, we can feed backwards the information we get today. So I think that'll be a big opportunity also. I'm actually a big fan of what we what we call resource invest, not uh, resource kind of uses of genomics instead of hypothesis testing. Um, you know, there, there probably isn't anyone who comes from the clinic who doesn't get their height and weight measured um, because you would then look back and stratify people by BMI for certain things, maybe not kids, sorry, Josh, but, um, but certainly for adults, you would do that. Um, there's a lot of reason to have this resource available so you can then use it to ask questions, um, even though the genetics was not asking a specific hypothesis. Uh, I, one of my hats is I, I run the, the Center for Inherited Disease Research, which is a high throughput genotyping uh, facility uh, that we offer to investigators. And um, it's taken a while to shift from, I wanna do genetics because I wanna find this gene to I want a new genetics because I need to know the spectrum of variation in the folks so I can relate it back to the phenotypes. And, and that does go to this strong suit that Clement and, and um, Nikki mentioned about deeper phenotyping is really going to be where there's lots of um, value. And the genetics is just the side product. Because a lot of the deep phenotyping will tell you something that will tell you it's not driven by genetics, which is also important to learn. Well, I think one of the projects that CGM is embarking on is um, resurrecting the CEF family. So it's about 600 individuals, 400 or so that are still living that have really deep phenotyping in that. A lot of that phenotype data 
has not been used and you can look at it in an inherited fashion as well as what is the normal human variation. So that's kind of been a, a fun project that we've resurrected over the last two, three years. Um, and we're starting to recruit the fourth generation, which is pretty cool. Please thank them on my behalf. Yeah. I mean, as someone who's used those cell lines for almost my entire career for different things, it, it's just very cool to think about you talking to someone uh, who's involved uh, directly as a participant. Uh, yeah, as a they, are, so. they, are, they are needed. And, and that story that the, um, I think Nikki was talking about the um, men, um, behavior and mental health and facial recognition, they're participating in, in a study of that too, of kind of just normal, healthy response. So it's kind of cool. Well, we are, we're, um, over time at this point, um, I would welcome if people want to just stay on and continue to chat, um, you are more than welcome. Um, and, uh, but I just wanted, if people need to leave, I, I totally understand that. Um, I wanted to launch Clement, if you have a, a moment, I wanted to ask you, um, I'm aware of, um, the because of Sean Taptigian, I'm aware of the efforts with the breast cancer gene to go through and basically characterize every single amino acid in the breast cancer gene. And as I read through this, I kind of it sounded like that 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 is one of those sort of long reaching. Wouldn't it be cool if we understood all of this variation? Are there are there other genes or diseases that we are in a good position where, where we could set up cell-based assays or high throughput zebrafish or something like that to start to really understand, you know, every base of an important gene? Well, I, I think that this certainly would apply to a whole host of disease genes for sure. I mean, so we, we, we consistently, especially in the rare disease world, you know, with with so few numbers of patients, it's really hard to build a phenotype phenotype map. Um, you know, we have just as many patients as we have alleles, and we don't. You don't have you know thousands of patients, so you don't have enough of any allele to know really what the what the what the relationship really is. And so I, I think that that's that's important for a lot of um, a lot of different genes. I think setting up the screening is challenging. I think that the phenotyping. And finding a phenotype that is relevant to the function, relevant enough to both the disease and the function of that gene that will that will be informative for all these variants, I think is is the barrier to this kind of screening. There's certainly a, a number.